So warm welcome to our second edition of the Euro LZ, uh, ELSO webinar series. Today's webinar will be uh, the uh, results of the long anticipated Eolia trial on uh, Vena Venus ECMO and CVRDS. And it's a special pleasure to have today with us the principal investigator of the trial, Alain Combs from Paris, France, who will be presenting uh, the results within the next uh, roughly 20 minutes. And afterwards, uh, we shall discuss uh, the findings and what it means together with uh, Giles Peak from New York, United States, and uh, Luciano Gattinoni from Göttingen, Göttingen Germany. Uh, my name is Peter Schellengowski, and I will be today's moderator. Now, you as participants will have the chance to enter your questions uh, into the online tool of the webinar, and I will get the questions and pass them on to our discussants. And I'm very much looking forward to a fruitful discussion for all of you. Thank you for joining today, and I will hand over to Alan Combs with his presentation on the EOLA trial. Welcome, everyone, again. So uh, thank you very much, Peter, and uh, hello, uh, everybody. Uh, this is a great pleasure for me to uh, be with you today uh, to uh, uh, present uh, the results of the EOLIA trial and then have a discussion with my good friends, uh, Giles and Luciano. So uh, the trial, as you know, has been published uh, in the May uh, 24th issue of the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this is my first, my disclosures. Uh, I worked uh, with uh, uh, Mackay Gettinger uh, on that trial, uh, which partly sponsored the study uh, for uh, supporting with uh, equipment. So first, uh, what was the rationale uh, for conducting uh, the EOLIA trial? Uh, as you remember, there's been major advances in the ECMO technology over the past 15 years. There's been uh, uh, some encouraging results also uh, published uh, with patients with the uh, H1N1 and used uh, ARDS, and also uh, the positive results of the CISA trial. Although the trial was uh, a little bit criticized uh, from some uh, methodological issue we might discuss with uh, Giles Peak, who uh, was the primary uh, investigator of that trial uh, at the end of this presentation. So uh, this is why the uh, efficacy of VV ECMO in severe ARDS patients was still uh, question and uh, the issue was remaining controversial. Uh, so this is why we uh, designed the uh, EOLIA trial uh, to determine if uh, uh, very early initiation of ECMO in patients with the most severe form of uh, ARDS would improve uh, their outcomes. Uh, the trial was a multi-center, international, uh, randomized, uh, using a sequential design and we might discuss also this issue a little bit uh, after the end of uh, this talk. Uh, and uh, the randomization was web-based and stratified by center and also by duration of mechanical ventilation uh, before randomization. Uh, randomization. Randomization was possible at non-ECMO centers, uh, in centers with uh, good expertise in the management of the RDS. And also, if it was possible for the ECMO retrieval team to reach the patient within two hours uh, following randomization, uh, if the patient was randomized to the ECMO group uh, in a non-ECMO center, then it was uh, transferred back on ECMO uh, to uh, the uh, ECMO center. Uh, the patients, patients were qualifying for selection if they were uh, intubated for less than seven days, uh, if uh, they received optimization of mechanical ventilation before inclusion uh, with an FIO2 of at least 0.8, uh, a tidal volume set at 6 mm per kilo predicted body weight, and uh, the PEEP uh, had to be set at least at 10 uh, also uh, for the evaluation of severity. Then uh, the patient uh, were qualifying with one of these three disease severity criteria. Uh, the first one was a PF ratio below 50 for more than six, for more than, uh, uh, below 50 for more than three hours. Uh, despite the potential use of uh, nitric oxide, recruitment maneuvers, prone positioning, and uh, HFO at that time also was also possible. Second criteria, uh, a PF below 80 meters of mercury for more than six hours, uh, despite just the same similar criteria. And the last one was the pH below 7.25, uh, was a PCO2 over 60 continuously for more than six hours, 
And it's very important to mention that uh, these uh, pH and pCO2 uh, criteria were resulting from MV settings to keep a safe plateau pressure. And in most of these patients, it resulted for an increase of tidal volume to uh, remain uh, at a safe uh, plateau of less than 32. And also despite the mandatory uh, uh, setting of the respiratory rate to uh, 35 per minute. Exclusion criteria were patient on MV for more than seven days, pregnancy, massively obese patients, uh, patients with chronic respiratory insufficiency, uh, with uh, uh, the need for oxygen therapy on NIV, uh, patients in need of VA ECMO because of severe cardiac failure, history of FIT, uh, malignancy with survival uh, of less than five years expected, and very severe patient dues uh, who had a SAP2 over 90, uh, massive uh, neurological injury, or the decision to withhold or withdraw. Uh, life uh, sustaining therapies. Uh, it was not possible also if the ECMO device was not uh, immediately available. Uh, the tri procedures now, uh, patients randomized to the ECMO group received percutaneous VV ECMO. Importantly, we targeted a very low anticoagulation with uh, infraction aparin in these patients, uh, targeting an APTT between 40 and 55 seconds. Uh, we also use uh, ultra protective mechanical ventilator settings, uh, either with a volume assist control ventilation with a PEEP of at least 10, and a tidal volume set for reaching a plateau pressure of less than 24 centimeters of water. It was also possible to use uh, pressure control ventilation with bi level PAP or APRV uh, with a low pressure above 10, a high pressure below 24. Uh, and we were using APRV with the uh, classical uh, inspiration to expiration ratio of one to two. Uh, FIO2 was set between 30 and 50, if possible, and uh, the uh, respiratory rate was left to uh, uh, the uh, discretion of uh, uh, the physician caring for the patients. Controls uh, got uh, MV settings according to the high recruitment strategy of the express try, in, in which the title was set at six ml per kilo, and the PEEP was set to reach a plateau pressure uh, between 28 and 30 centimeters of water. There was also a strong recommendation for the use of prolonged periods of prone positioning and the use of paralyzing agents. In case of hypoxemia, uh, the patient might could have benefited from recruitment maneuvers, uh, nitric oxide or prostacycline. We use the uh, McKay uh, CardioHelp uh, and Canula for uh, cannulation and the management uh, uh, on ECMO uh, of the uh, Eolia patients. And uh, this is a very important feature also of the uh, Eolia trial. Uh, there was uh, a rescue ECMO uh, uh, ethical option for controls. Those who had a refractory hypoxemia uh, defined as the blood saturation in oxygen less than 80% for more than six hours continuously uh, and very importantly, this was despite the mandatory trial of prone positioning and recruitment maneuvers and uh, inhaled NO or prostacycline. And of course, if the treating physician uh, felt that uh, uh, the patient had no ir irreversible uh, multipolar failure uh, and that ECMO might change the outcome of the patient. The endpoints, the primary endpoint was mortality at 60 days. And we had the key uh, secondary endpoint of treatment failure at day 60. Uh, treatment failure was uh, death in ECMO patients and death or crossover to ECMO in controls. Secondary endpoints, mortality at other time points, the time to death until day 60, and also the number of days alive and free of many interventions such as uh, catecholamine, dialysis, mechanical ventilation, organ failure, adjuvant uh, uh, therapies for ERDS and also the duration of ICU and hospital stay. And also very importantly, uh, safety outcomes were also uh, evaluated uh, for uh, this uh, EOLIA trial. The stats, uh, we expected 60% uh, mortality uh, for controls and 20% uh, absolute reduction in mortality uh, with ECMO from 60 down to 40%. Uh, with an alpha of uh, 5% and a beta of 20%, and using uh, this uh, group sequential uh, analysis, every 60 patients included, and once again using the two-sided uh, triangular design for early stopping, 
the maximum sample size was 331 participants, and uh, we had a probability of stopping the study of more than 90% uh, at 220 patients enrolled. Uh, the primary endpoint was analyzed intention to treat, and we also had uh, multivariable Cox regression to adjust for confounders, and also uh, we defined post-doc a very specific analysis, which is called the RANG preserving structural fellow time uh, analysis to adjust for crossover uh, in the estimation of survival. So now the results. Uh, the try uh, was stopped early uh, here uh, when the cross uh, went outside uh, the Christmas tree of the uh, sequential design. Uh, the DSMB stopped the try uh, after 249 patients had been included. Uh, because of, uh, there was a prediction of lack of difference, even if the study was continued uh, until uh, the uh, next uh, interim was scheduled at 300 patients included. Uh, there's been uh, more than 1,000 patients assessed for eligibility. Uh, most of the excluded patients were those already on ECMO or had been on MV for more than seven days. So overall, there was 249 patients uh, randomized. Uh, 124 were randomized to uh, uh, the ECMO group. Of these 124, uh, three did not get ECMO, two died uh, before we had time to uh, insert cannula, and one in patient improved uh, very rapidly, so he did not receive ECMO. All these patients were included in the primary intention to treat uh, analysis. 125 were uh, randomized to the control group, and of these 35, this is 28% uh, received rescue ECMO, and uh, we're going to discuss uh, also very uh, in detail uh, this uh, uh, population of uh, rescued patient. Uh, patient characteristics uh, at randomization, there was no difference between the two groups. Uh, patients were very sick uh, with a mean SOFA score of close to 11. Uh, they were randomized very rapidly after the uh, uh, intubation for and mechanical ventilation. Uh, the cause of ARDS was mainly pneumonia uh, in two thirds of the patients, and the mean PF ratio uh, was uh, around 72 uh, in both groups. Uh, at the time of randomization, the PEEP was around 12, tidal was at six, uh, respiratory rate was around 30, uh, the plateau was close to 30 centimeters of water. Uh, the driving uh, was close to 18, and the compliance of the respiratory system was 25. Uh, the patient uh, had a PCO2 of uh, 57 in both groups. Uh, what is very important here also is that uh, uh, close to 60% of the patient in both groups uh, were pruned uh, before uh, they were included, and uh, virtually all of them uh, received a neuromuscular blockade. Uh, also uh, before inclusion in the trial. Trial treatment now, uh, in blue uh, is the control patients and in red in ECMO patients. Uh, the tidal volume was decreased from around six to less than four, around three ml per kilo uh, uh, very rapidly with ECMO. Uh, the plateau pressure also was decreased to less than 25. The PEEP was a little bit decreased in the ECMO group, but there was no significant difference. And uh, very importantly, the driving pressure also was decreased uh, from uh, uh, 18 down to 16 for controls to less than 14, around 13 uh, for uh, patients uh, uh, in the uh, ECMO group. PaCO2 uh, was controlled by uh, the uh, ECMO machine. The pH also increased significantly. Uh, blood saturation also uh, increased more rapidly uh, in uh, the uh, ECMO uh, group uh, patients. Uh, this is another very important uh, results of the EOLIA trial. Uh, when looking at uh, the additional treatment received for uh, ARDS, uh, virtually also almost all of the ECMO group patients were prone. Uh, it was 90% of them. Uh, and there was a significant difference between the two groups. Uh, all of them uh, received neuromuscular blockade. And uh, there were more patients in the control group receiving a, a nitric oxide uh, recruitment maneuvers, uh, but no difference in the rate of patients re receiving corticosteroids. We also compare the outcome of patients randomized in the control group uh, at ECMO uh, and non-ECMO centers because it was an important feature of uh, our trial, and there was no difference. Uh, no difference in the setting of tidal volume, plateau, PEEP, driving pressures, 
uh, and also no difference in the management uh, regarding prone positioning, uh, neuromuscular blockade, nitric oxide, recruitment maneuver, corticosteroids, series, and uh, uh, renal uh, repressment therapy. The primary endpoint, uh, mortality was 35% in the ECMO group and 46% uh, percent in the control group. The difference was 11%, but did not reach statistical significance. Uh, survival, uh, the mortality uh, was uh, clearly higher, but the, uh, the p-value for the comparison between the two groups was 0.07, uh, and with another ratio of uh, 0.70. The key secondary endpoint, once again, was deaths in ECMO patients and deaths or crossover to ECMO in controls. Uh, there was a, a highly significant difference in favor of the ECMO group. Uh, the endpoint was reached by 35% of the ECMO group and 57% of uh, uh, control group patients. And once again, this difference was highly significant with a p-value uh, below 0.001. This is the results of uh, the sophisticated round preserving uh, structural fellow time, uh, which is a way uh, to control for crossover uh, in controls. And as you can see uh, here, the uh, hazard ratio was 0 0.51 with a p-value, which is just on the threshold is at uh, 0 0.055. Not quite significant, but this time is just uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the limit. Other endpoints. Uh, patients were on uh, ECMO for a mean duration of uh, around 15 days. Uh, this is a very important result also of the EOLIA trial. Uh, patients randomized to the ECMO group uh, did better, especially when looking at the number of days alive and free of vasopressors, this number was higher for the ECMO group. Was true also uh, for the number of days free of cardiac failure free of dialysis, free of renal failure, free of prone positioning, and free of NO uh, and prostacycline. And all of these secondary outcomes were highly significantly different uh, between uh, the two groups. Crossover occurred in 28% of the patients, 35 out of 125. Uh, and it was uh, almost one week on average uh, post-randomization. This patient at baseline was more severe uh, than uh, the uh, control, uh, that those patients were in the control group who were not crossed over. Uh, they had a higher plateau pressure, higher driving pressure, lower respiratory system compliance, and also more infiltrate on chest X-ray. We analyzed uh, clinical and biological parameters uh, in uh, these patients who were crossed over as you can see here, in the hours, let's say in two to six hours before they were crossed, uh, the inotropic score uh, increased exponentially, was true also for lactate, uh, while the PF ratio uh, on average was around 50 uh, when they received uh, the crossover. Uh, at the time they were crossed over, uh, of these 35 patients, nine at cardiac arrest, seven at uh, undergo uh, severe right heart failure and 11 at develop renal failure uh, requiring dialysis. Uh, we had to apply VA ECMO to seven patients for refractory left ventricle failure and six of these actually received ECMO under CPR. Uh, this is the uh, survival of all these patients. So it's 35 for ECMO group patients, 46 overall for all controls but the mortality for those who were crossed over was much higher, was 57. And even those patients in the control group uh, with, were not crossed, and these patients were less severe uh, than uh, uh, the overall group of uh, uh, controls, uh, the mortality was still higher, it was 41, not significantly different, of course, but uh, higher uh, than in the uh, ECMO group. Now, adverse events, uh, there were more thrombocytopenia uh, with ECMO, which is an expected uh, 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 event, uh, also more transfusion in uh, ECMO patients. And this also is a very important point. Uh, there's been uh, bad signals for a year uh, with ECMO in terms of uh, stroke and especially hemorrhagic stroke. And uh, in Aeolia, actually there were less stroke in ECMO patients and uh, there was also less hemorrhagic stroke uh, in uh, ECMO patients. 
bleeding. Uh, there was some bleeding in the ECMO patients, you know, almost a, a little bit of more than half of them was mainly minor bleeding uh, at the cannula insertion site, was easily controlled. 14% of the patients had uh, infection at uh, the cannula insertion site, and 5% of them uh, got uh, hemolysis. So uh, this is the first conclusion we can draw from uh, uh, the trial. Uh, okay, 60-day mortality, 35 versus 46. This is an 11% difference. Was not statistically significantly lower uh, than with the strategy of conventional mechanical vent ventilation that included ECMO, the rescue therapy, there is signal, the p-value is 0.07, but did not reach uh, statistical significance. Still, we need to mention that rescue patients uh, were extremis, extremely sick before crossover, and uh, almost 60% of them died, actually. And uh, this is uh, uh, also a major point which should be discussed uh, uh, next. So I have a couple of slides uh, showing what I believe uh, Aeolia should be considered a positive trial. First, looking at the latest about ERDS, uh, the mortality uh, in the uh, lung safe study was 46 for patients with severe ERDS. Looking at uh, randomized trials, recent one, uh, Oscillate for HFO in Canada, uh, patients in the control group mortality was 35, just the same mortality as we did uh, observed in April patients, but the PF of these patients was 121, was 72 uh, in Eolia. Uh, the uh, UK Oscar trial, uh, mortality was uh, over 40. Uh, once again, the PF was, was much higher than Eolia. And uh, this is the results of the heart trial, uh, which was discussed at the San Diego ATS meeting uh, just before uh, uh, the Eolia trial was presented. Uh, in this trial, mortality was even higher, over 50. Uh, with the PF ratio at the inclusion was uh, 119. Uh, once again, much higher, uh, probably much less severe uh, patients than uh, those randomized in the uh, EOLIA trial. So this is a difficult trial to analyze, of course, because of all these patients were crossed over. So uh, this uh, intention to treat analysis is clearly uh, 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 not benefiting from uh, the intention to treat when comparing the uh, mortality of the two groups. Uh, okay, uh, treatment failure is probably biased in favor of the ECMO group. And this uh, rank uh, failure uh, analysis might be the one closer to uh, the actual effect of ECMO. And uh, uh, at that, uh, uh, with this analysis, uh, the other ratio is uh, 0 0.51 with a p-value, which is uh, very, very close to the statistical significance. Uh, this may be one of my last slides. Uh, we also analyzed uh, um, uh, what would have been uh, the uh, treatment failure rate uh, in uh, uh, the controls if those controls had not received ECMO. And we made some hypothesis on the survival of these control patients if they had not received ECMO. If 10%, 20 or one third of these patients would have survived uh, without ECMO, uh, the percentage of uh, treatment failure would have still be significant in favor of the ECMO group. And taking into account the severity of the control patient at the time they received ECMO, uh, I guess that less than one third of the patient that would have survived uh, without, and probably uh, I would say less than 10% uh, would have survived without. And this also was discussed uh, by an editorial published uh, at the same time in New England by Jeff Drazen, who is the uh, editor-in-chief of the New England. And uh, Dr. Drazen concluded that ECMO has probably some benefit in this context, despite the trial not being traditionally positive. It means that Dr. Drazen, I believe, uh, thought that the study was uh, actually uh, positive. And uh, uh, this is also what he concluded here. Uh, uh, based on the, what we did uh, with this uh, postdoc uh, analysis. So this is my last slide. Uh, these are all the PIs uh, of the uh, EOLIA trial. And uh, once again, uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, uh, participating in that trial. Uh, it was an immense uh, effort uh, lasting more than five years uh, for the recruitment of the patients. And uh, I'm very proud of the group uh, once again. And uh, uh, I'm uh, very honored also to be part of this webinar, and uh, I let the uh, uh, speech now to uh, uh, Peter, uh, Giles, uh, and Luciano.
Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for your pre very clear presentation. And um, I mean, congratulations for this huge effort to you and the entire uh, network that was included into the study. That's it, really been a huge effort and, and data that all of us have been waiting for such a long time. So, Giles, I'd, I'd like to pass on the, the first question to you. What we are talking about p-value significance, and, and at the same time, the, the editor of the New England is saying, well, there are some positive aspects or there are some, some positivity to the trial, which was traditionally not positive. What's your perspective? What, what does it mean? What does Aeolia tell us? Mm. Well, I'd like to add my congratulations to Alain and his whole um, uh, team of collaborators. There are two problems with, um, or two answers to that question. One is ethical, and the other one is um, the limitation of frequentist statistics. Now, if we look at this, um, you know, in a Bayesian kind of fashion, or just in common sense, you can see that there are more survivors when we use ECMO, um, and it doesn't quite reach classical frequentist 0 0.05 significance. So the real world outcome, which is the secondary endpoint, which is improved um, uh, or, or reduced um, treatment failure in the ECMO group, um, really highlights the ethical problem with studies in life support following CSER um, and that is you can't have death as the endpoint anymore. So although it clearly wasn't obvious at the time, because it takes 10 years to do any one of these studies, so we started CESA 20 years ago, and I started um, with uh, Eolia planning, you know, around 10 years ago. It takes five years to do it. Um, and um, what you see is that the goalposts move and treatment has moved in the meantime. So... Really, we can't have any trials where death is the endpoint anymore. We have to look at treatment failure. And I think that if you could uh, jump into a time machine and go back and redesign the study, Alain, you would um, probably design it with treatment failure as the endpoint. Yeah, uh, probably. Uh, second, uh, I did not mention that there is a lot of information also uh, uh, when looking at the subgroups. And there was very interesting feature uh, of Eolia uh, looking at the subgroups. Uh, from the beginning, I was uh, thinking that uh, the most benefit for, would be uh, for the patients with the most severe forms of ARDS uh, uh, in terms of the PF ratio. And actually, when we look at the subgroups, this is not the main paper, this is on the online supplement. It's those patients who had the PF above the median. The median was a 66. And it was those population of patients who got the most benefit from uh, 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 ECMO. Uh, so uh, I would also have probably increased the PF for entry uh, in Eolia. And I, was, uh, I would have set the limit at 100. Uh, the Berlin definition for severe, uh, but it's okay. It's uh, ten, 10 years later and it's, uh, uh, it's only postdoc, so it's speculation. Uh, but it's probably those patients for whom it was possible to decrease the intensity of mechanical ventilation, those patients with the least severe form, patients with uh, 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 only uh, uh, lung failure, uh, probably which benefited the most from, uh, from the strategy. Alan, let me give you a question that comes from the audience, and, uh, and, I've, and I've heard this question a couple of times before. The question is, can we conclude from this trial that BV ECMO should only be used as a rescue strategy in, so to say, those who might have been crossover patients in the control group? Is that the answer to the trial? What's your perspective? Uh, from my perspective, uh, this is not the uh, 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 conclusion which should be drawn uh, from the trial. Uh, when looking at those patients uh, who were rescued, uh, if we would select ECMO only for the most severe patient, especially those who fail on uh, classical treatment, the mortality uh, of uh, this group of patients is 57%. 
uh, in Eolia. Uh, this uh, information is not also mentioned in the in the paper, but we did uh, a case control study matching these 35 patients who were crossed over to a group of patients who were randomized to the ECMO group who had the same severity at baseline. It, it's true that it is not the same population of patients those who were crossed over and were sicker uh, at randomization. And we, when we matched uh, these 35 patients control who were crossed to ECMO patients of the same severity at baseline, mortality of uh, control patients was 57, as you remember, and the mortality of the same uh, group of same severity randomized to ECMO was only 32. Uh, well, uh, this is postdoc, okay, uh, and uh, it does not provide uh, the, the full answer. But together with this 11% mortality difference, the fact that there was less uh, cardiac failure, less renal failure associated with ECMO, uh, well, uh, this is a lot of, uh, I think, uh, 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 information in favor of the ECMO group. Although, as mentioned by Drazen, in the editorial, the study will never, cannot be considered as a traditionally positive trial. It's not traditionally, but there's a lot of positive signal uh, in, in these trials. Luciano, why would you uh, support the uh, understanding that this overall could be interpreted as a positive study? And why, as a second question, could it be very hard to prove in a traditional way that the assumption of cutting down mortality from 60 to 40 could be possible with a device like this? You know, uh, we, we started the ECMO and we never stopped more than 30 years ago. And we never thought to design a randomized trial for a very simple reason. That we realized since the beginning that uh, if such a trial is uh, in the traditional way, let's call it the traditional way, unfeasible. Because uh, now you can spend uh, one hour to discuss uh, the statistics of the other trial. But if you move two patients or three patients from one group to the other one, everything changes. So the believers will continue to say, great. One thing is sure, we don't kill anybody with them. And this is already a great, great success. The data about the hemorrhagia, cerebral hemorrhagia, are extremely interesting. So there are a lot of information for which the others have to be congratulated. From that, to see that we reached the truth, uh, we, are not, we, are, we are very far, because I think that there is no question that in some patient cannot survive without ECMO. But for this patient, the randomization doesn't make any sense. You do not randomize the CPR. You don't randomize the transplant. Now, you transplant, you randomize what? The patient in which ECMO allowed through more oxygen to the venous blood, some difference in mechanical ventilation, right? Now, the question, the first question is how much is the mortality which is attributable to the, the mechanical ventilation that we do as we do now? Six milliliters, ten of P, blah blah. Five percent, ten percent, in severe RDS, mortality due to the mechanical ventilation. Let's see, is a seven percent. You need more than one thousand patients to have a significant values in the traditional way. Elena, the the all the people involved. They were randomized 1.2 patients, 1.3 patients per unit per year. An extremely low number. And a lot of patients are excluded. If I might say something which is absolutely politically incorrect, I don't care about the mortality. Taken as a, an absolute referral point. We randomize patients and we assume the randomization equal the patient for every aspect but what you do. To under 40 patients in this condition, you think that the randomization was perfectly equal in, in both. We have absolutely positive, in my opinion, 
positive aspect in, in this trial, but this will not change the world because the believer will continue to believe to that. And the non-believer, for economical reason, for whatever, who continue to say no. I remind you very respectfully that the most documented, effective treatment in intensive care to uh, prevent, uh, to, to decrease the mortality rate uh, is uh, the selective decontamination, which more than 20, 30 trials show the same thing and nobody use. So, belief and non-belief play in a tremendous role in our mind. So, I'm extremely glad that this study has uh, this uh, perspective. I was sure that could not reach the statistical point because to expect 20% absolute reduction due to mortality, due to the mechanical ventilation arm, to me was absolutely excessive. But anyway, uh, we do not kill the patients because my, I was afraid that maybe in this so severe population, well, all absolutely equal or some sign in the opposite side. So I'm perfectly satisfied. But I think we should stop to compare ECMO versus non-ECMO. We should start to study different approaches with artificial support. And we have a plenty of them. Forgetting artificial lung versus not artificial lung. This to me at the point is unfeasible and in part does not make sense. Luciano, I would like to pick up your point about the impact of the aggressive invasive mechanical ventilation on mortality and, and ask Allah, if you look at the data that came out over the last year on the prognostic impact of certain respiratory settings such as driving pressures and so on, do you think uh, looking back you were aggressive enough um, in reducing the invasiveness of mechanical ventilation in the ECMO group? Uh, we did decrease uh, the aggressivity, the intensity of mechanical ventilation. The tidal was reduced to around 3, the uh, driving was uh, reduced around 13. But I, I believe uh, we could have uh, even uh, decreased more uh, these uh, numbers. Uh, uh, with ECMO. Uh, uh, of course, if you reduce, for example, the tidal, you might de-recruit some part of the lungs and you might also uh, uh, have more uh, hypoxemia in some of these patients. So uh, it's a difficult issue. With ECMO, it's possible to con virtually control uh, any uh, 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 defect in oxygenation. Uh, the next step now is to uh, uh, evaluate the concept uh, with ECOR, uh, which is uh, uh, using the same technology, but with lower flows and no oxygenation. And uh, when looking once again at the uh, subgroups, uh, there's uh, this strong signal uh, that uh, those patients with the less severe forms of ARDS, at least those included in Eolia trial, uh, clearly had benefited from uh, 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 ECMO, and it's probably not from ECMO. Uh, they benefited from a, a decrease in the intensity of mechanical ventilation. And for those patients who had uh, many organ failing, uh, it's probably the impact of ECMO is a little bit less. So this is the next step now. Uh, with ECMO, clearly, we can virtually stop mechanical ventilation. Uh, should we? Uh, should we prone every patient on ECMO also? Uh, these are remaining questions which should be evaluated now. And I agree perfectly with, agree with Luciano. Uh, now we have to conduct study uh, on ECMO patients. Uh, I think uh, new studies like Eolia, uh, ECMO versus non-ECMO, are going to be very difficult to, uh, 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 to, 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 to conduct uh, in the near future. And then we have to focus on the way we are treating those patients on ECMO, uh, which population should receive ECMO, uh, which population should receive less uh, invasive forms of extracorporeal lung support like ECOR. Uh, these are the questions we have to answer now in the coming years. Giles, does this trial in any way affect your daily practice? I think the subgroup analysis, um, that, uh, well, two things about the uh, that are really useful to me. The first one is the, 
thing that Anna highlighted just now about the improved benefit in patients that are not particularly sick. And the second one is the reduction in um, stroke uh, and multi-organ failure. So when I'm consulting with a patient with my colleagues and we're wondering if the patient is sick enough for ECMO, this strengthens the idea that if you go on earlier, you may prevent uh, end organ damage. Uh, and so I think that's a very useful um, outcome. I think that's a very important message of the study that this is a safe technique. Uh, if it's used in a way that you did in your, your very dedicated research network. And Ella, maybe that, that could be a question to those uh, who are not so familiar with the uh, detailed contents of the study. What was your anticoagulation strategy in the ECMO patients? Uh, this is a very important point. Uh, from the beginning, we uh, thought that uh, uh, the decrease in the level of anticoagulation with infection apparel was a key issue. Uh, to get better results, and especially less uh, hemorrhagic complication, and specifically less hemorrhagic stroke. The rate of hemorrhagic stroke was uh, close to 10% uh, in the series, uh, for example, from uh, down under, from uh, Australia, for uh, the H1N1 patients. Uh, and at that time, I think they were using a, a, a full anticoagulation in these patients. This, way, this is why, in Eolia, we decided to have very little anticoagulation uh, let's say uh, on average per day, uh, the patients will receive between 6,000 and 10,000 units of fraction heparin, which is very low. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, APTT, which was targeted, was between 40 and 55 times 55 seconds. So it's between 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, the, uh, the control. Uh, and uh, this is made possible by new machines, new circuits. Uh, which are now coated with airprint and more biocompatible. And if you use also high flows uh, with the latest generation machine, you can run the circuit at 5, 5.5 and 6 liters per minute. And probably the higher the flow, uh, the less uh, a thrombosis clots uh, forming also within the circuits, and makes, which makes it possible uh, to reduce anticoagulation. This is a key point. Uh, about uh, VV ECMO. It's probably not true for VA. Uh, in VA patients, we still need uh, probably full anticoagulation with the, the blood is reinjected uh, into the uh, aorta. But for VV, clearly, uh, one of the key points to get better results is to have very low anticoagulation. Giles? I think uh, I would completely agree with Alan's comments, but I would draw your attention to the amount of thrombocytopenia that you had in the ECMO group. And I think more and more people are now moving away from heparin as an anticoagulant and using um, uh, direct thrombin inhibitors like bivalirunin. And when we use that agent for children on Berlin Heart, for instance, we see a massive reduction in stroke rate. Now, um, I believe that in the next 10 years, we're going to see um, those agents like Argatraban and bivalirunin used probably uh, exclusively instead of heparin in both VV and VA ECMO. Um, now, obviously, that's going to require all kinds of uh, trials and investigation. But um, I think getting rid of the um, thrombocytopenia, um, which you don't see with these new agents, um, I think will also reduce the impact uh, of ECMO because you'll reduce the need for platelet transfusion. And um, as we've learned a couple of weeks ago during the annual meeting of EuroL, so there are uh, appropriate trials going on looking at these questions. Exactly. Luciani, I, I would like to pick up um, a, a point that uh, Alain has already mentioned and that's popping up in the questions of our audience. Can we improve outcome if we really strictly prone severe RDS patients on ECMO in the first phase of their, of their acute illness? What do you well, expect? It, it depends uh, not only if you prone or not, but uh, how do you treat the patient during the prone? Because there is not any maneuver which is a miracle. Prone. Why works prone? The people say because I recruit more, which is not true. Because uh, it depends. In some patients, prone does not recruit. But prone makes a different distribution of forces throughout the lung. That means whatever bad thing we do to the lung are less bad 
in that in prone position that is supine. That's it. So if I use a tidal volume which is excessive, it's less dangerous. In prone, that is supine and so on. Personally, we use it to prone and to keep the patient prone in uh, during uh, uh, during ECMO. For this simple reason. But I think the real point is to understand how to treat the lung. Because if I respect them, may advance a word of caution and continue to diminish, to, 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 to decrease the tidal volume, means atelectasis. And means atelectasis such as uh, that you maybe require more than 100 centimeters of water to try to open up. We did all this mistake. We try not to not ventilate completely the lamp, and the lamp becomes a piece of stone. And the tidal volume is not the devil. It depends also by the frequency. I remind you that sometimes uh, in a deeper breath below the total lung capacity may help if it's done one every three, four, five minutes, not 20 times of minutes. So I think. Uh, and the real question, you have to sit down and ask yourself, why giving some oxygen through the venous blood should improve the survival? As a rescue for terrible hypoxia is clear. But tell me, if you are not a rescue, which are the reasons? So if the results are positive, that means that we decrease the dangers of something else which is the mechanical ventilation. At which limit, in which uh, it has to be investigated, the complete rest of the lung, that means leave the lung like this, uh, is a disaster. The complete movement probably is wrong. This is why we should decide, we, have, we are not ready to start, but I think maybe in one year, we could start uh, in a trial uh, try to compare the most rest as possible with some uh, bigger breath uh, versus uh, a more movement. The patient do stay in mechanics, so that means which are the condition of ventilation we may enhance eating, not just to prevent the bad thing, but maybe to enhance something positive. We have to start to think in that way, I think. And I'm sure, as you say, if uh, we solve, uh, or somebody will solve the problem of uh, hemorrhagia and the coagulation problem, the, the picture will change completely with the aim. Will be with something completely different. Not only in the RDS, but in a lot of condition. So we, we are we are an open open sky to fly it in. But we have just to stop with this trial with a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of energy, which I think should be devoted to doing something more uh, productive. With a lot of congratulations to these people. Ten years and five years, you know. And we're speaking about that since twenty years, probably, right? So we become older with this. Hmm? Along with this uh, perspective of Luciano's and uh, with the open questions that you had already mentioned, uh, with the open questions that you had already mentioned before, what are the next trials that we are looking into? If you look at your own research network, what are the next things that you will specifically look at you are you going to do something about prone positioning is that something that you're interested in no with uh, uh, we we design the trial which is called romeo is an acronym which i don't remember what it means is a rest versus movement something like that let's see that you take a patient and watch are ventilated as in aeolia so 10 12 people uh, and another which are ventilated let's see two breaths per minute same mean airway pressure, possibly, just don't have problem with oxygenation. And look as a surrogate of enhancing, uh, sur enhancing uh, healing uh, at the time you spend uh, in uh, mechanical ventilation. 
in, in, during the in extracorporeal support. You will examine only the survivors. That means the doctor decides who goes in ECMO. So no question, ECMO or non ECMO. Everybody in ECMO, because the doctor say, okay, this has to go in ECMO, will be randomized A or B. Uh, you need about 200 survival if you want to see a difference uh, which to be clinically significant uh, in length of stay in ECMO of about 20%. That means 8 days versus 10 or 11 days versus, uh, versus 13. And this uh, just tell you we need complete rest or some movement. Let's see that the complete rest, uh, this does, does not prove necessary. At this point, you can forget uh, the high flow ECMO by the rescue, because you may, may provide a moderate movement uh, with a minimally invasive uh, as the corporeal CO2 removal. If the rest proves superior, you have to continue with high flow. So this is the, the kind of way that I can see. And we are absolutely ignorant about healing. We never spoken about that. We just look at the damages of mechanic ventilation. So, Elan, any, what are the things that's gone? Everybody going disappear to... here. I'm uh, alone. Okay. <laughs> we are still here. So, um, Elan, what's coming out of your research pipeline in the near future? So uh, the big questions now, as uh, mentioned by Luciano, is uh, how should we ventilate uh, those patients under ECMO? Uh, so this uh, should be the focus of future trial. And uh, the next one we would like to conduct is a trial of prone positioning, early prone positioning in ECMO patients. We have applied for a grant here in France uh, to conduct that study next year. Uh, I hope we're going to, to get the funds uh, to get uh, this study uh, performed. Uh, it's not about mortality because I, I don't think mortality would improve uh, 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 with the prone positioning of ECMO patients, but uh, I, I do believe there might be uh, uh, longer ECMO runs. Uh, That's right. And, uh, yeah. I think this is the way to go. Yeah. To look in ECMO patient different, so not tremendous studies that last five years, but to concentrate in a reasonable uh... yeah and uh, the way we will conduct that uh, statistically speaking is to use competitive risk models uh, because the the best way to get rid of ECMO is to die very early uh, so you have three risks here uh, to die early or uh, to remain on ECMO or to be weaned from ECMO uh, and these are the three uh, competitive risks you have to uh, 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 measure and adjust and the hypothesis here is that the prone positioning uh, will decrease the time uh, of uh, ECMO for those surviving. So you this look at the survivors. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As the Romeo trial, you look yeah. at the survivors to the, and let ECMO with, stay. On yes, ECMO. With, with, with early prone positioning uh, within the first uh, 24 hours. Charles, what's your perspective on, on the pressing questions that should be answered apart from the anticoagulation thing you've mentioned before? I think um, I'm very glad to have passed the baton on to um, such uh, an illustrious team as uh, Alain's uh, team in terms of ARDS and adults. Uh, as you know, um, I have a part-time job as a paediatric heart surgeon, and um, I'm particularly interested in what happens to um, kids who had a Fontan operation and now got a failed systemic right ventricle and how to support those patients um, and how to transplant those patients who have heart and liver failure. And um, uh, that is a, a, the sort of crossroads between uh, mechanical circulatory support with durable devices and ECMO tends to be used um, in both resuscitation and also to support transplantation. Um, so um, that's my next big question, really, is the failed systemic right ventricle. Okay. So apparently, since this is a Euro ELSA webinar, there shall be, or there, there is most likely uh, 
a lot of people who really believe in ECMO. Um, my take home message for myself is that looking at the OLEA trial, we've learned that um, secondary, important secondary outcomes seem to be in favor of ECMO therapy in those qualifying for the inclusion criteria. ECMO seems to be a safe method when conducted like uh, as it has been done in this research network. And um, ECMO seems as analyzed in treatment failure seems to have a lot of benefits. And, and even with regard to mortality, there seems to be positive factors that cannot tradition be expressed traditionally as in the metrics that we have been using before. Now, maybe some closing remarks with very, very um, simple expressions. Giles, whenever someone who does not have an opinion about ECMO approaches you and, and asks you, we've got this new trial, what should we do? What's your straightforward answer to that question? I think that um, like um, the Mad Hatter in um, Alice in Wonderland, Alain's uh, study means precisely what you choose it to mean. So if you believe that ECMO is a good thing, you can interpret it in that way. If you believe that it's a bad thing, you can interpret it in that way. However, what is the certainty is that 3 a.m. when the non-ECMO believers, either patient or relative, is dying, they will be straight on the phone to the ECMO centre. Luciano, a short closing remark of yours. And I absolutely agree with uh, with Jill. And just one thing: that the medicine over the centuries progressed without any randomized trial. Alain, I would like to to pass the last comment uh, to you as the PI of this wonderful study and as our president in EuroELSO. What's your message? Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank you all uh, for attending this uh, very interesting webinar. Uh, also, I would like to thank, uh, I think at what time there were close to 130 page, uh, people attending, which is, is very uh, also uh, grateful. Uh, we're great, very grateful to these people and it's, it's a huge success for uh, our uh, organization, Euro So and, uh, I'm very proud of that. And uh, I'm also very proud of Peter for organizing uh, these successful webinars. Uh, back to Eolia, uh, first, uh, uh, as mentioned by Jais and Luciano, uh, at least we didn't kill the patients. 35% uh, survive uh, mortality is, is very low uh, in uh, these uh, patients who are quite sick uh, at inclusion. So uh, even though the 11% uh, mortality benefit was not significant, the signal is here. Uh, so there is room now for uh, more uh, data, more studies, but uh, as mentioned before, maybe more in the way we manage the patient on ECMO uh, than uh, answering uh, the question about uh, uh, VV ECMO versus uh, control treatment. Okay, I think that's a very clear statement. Thank you so much, Alain. Thank you, Luciano and Giles, for being our discussants today. I think it's been very fruitful. Thank you for all of you out there who joined today's webinar. And if you came back in, back, uh, or if you came in late, be assured that uh, all of this webinar uh, are uh, recorded and you will be able to have a look at it and, and rewind uh, when you go to the EuroELSO website in the future. Thank you so much, all of you, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.